Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, sorry. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. I'm Representative Bill White, represent the 161st uh, District out of Joplin McCain area. My bill is House Bill 7, uh, 95. It's a freedom to work bill. It's very similar to House Bill 77 that we heard last week, with the exception that my bill uh, has a statutory implementation as opposed to uh, proceeding to a ballot for implementation. Uh, there was a great deal of testimony last week from witnesses. I do not plan on duplicating most of that uh, testimony today. I did not re-invite the same people to come back and say the same things, most of them. Uh, so we do have a few uh, witnesses in favor that will be testifying. Uh, this bill gives Missouri workers the freedom to choose uh, to join a union or not join a union. It gives them the freedom of association, which is a, a, a key factor, a uh, key fundamental right for all of us. Uh, there's a secondary issue that I'll talk about in a minute, which is the economic aspect of this. But uh, on a freedom of association, a worker should be free to seek or to retain a job without being forced to give up part of their hard-earned income to a third party they do not wish to associate with. If a worker wishes to pay a fee, join uh, or pay dues to a union to represent them, this bill protects that right. This bill protects both rights to either be a member of a union or not be a member of a union and to protect that worker uh, for hiring and firing, that the status of the labor association it cannot be a consideration in either of those acts. Second, to have a job, uh, well, to be offered a job, a job has to exist. Missouri is losing to our other six border states that are right to our freedom to work states. Uh, we are losing in this competition for growing our economy. The, those six states overall have greater job growth, they have lower unemployment, they have a lower percentage of uninsured, and they have uh, roughly equal cost of living adjusted wages, with three of them being higher than the state of Missouri, of the six. Last week we heard that the unions must represent all workers, and that's the reason for these fees that they have to pay if they decide not to join unions. This is only a half truth. Without a security agreement, which unions always seek, uh, uh, which is a term of the contract with their employers to recognize the union entity as, or the labor organization, as an exclusive bargaining agent, the union does not represent all those people. Uh, the fact that, it, you know, without a security agreement, you can have multiple unions in a facility. Uh, you can have people that are in one or more unions and or not in the union at all. Uh, I was told, uh, you know, that by labor we heard in testimony that corporations like this, that corporations want a security agreement uh, because it's easier to deal with. My bill isn't designed to please corporations. It's designed to protect the freedom of association of Missouri workers and to return them the ability to be able to spend their hard-earned money as they see fit. We also heard last week about the freeloader uh, concept uh, that was argued would be the result of a freedom to work bill. I disagree with this contention. First, those workers who decide to form or join a union, uh, whether it be by 51% or 99% of those there, did so for themselves. They had an expectation of what they wanted to achieve, whether there were 51% or 99%, it made no difference to the numbers, as long as they were in a the majority. They want, they have an agenda of what they would like to see happen and change in their workplace. They aren't doing it for those that are not part of their union. They're doing it because it's what they feel is in their best interest, which makes a lot of sense. Okay. You know, for those people who benefit that don't want to be part of the union, don't want to associate for whatever reason, don't want to have to pay those fees, uh, their benefit is a collateral benefit. It is not that they are freeloading. They did not want to have, perhaps, if the union is just formed, they did not vote. They did not want the union to appear. Uh, they are getting a collateral benefit based on what the people who created that union want. Uh, we had some real estate examples I didn't really agree with last week, but I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, if I build a house, a nice, really big house next to a moderately priced house, that house's property value goes up. You know, do they have to, like, pay me some money somehow for that? No, it's a collateral benefit to the people that live next to me. 
you know, I did. I built the house there because it's what I wanted. If you know, it was my goal. Uh, collateral benefits or collateral damage in other scenarios happens. So, the fact that someone is going to benefit from an action you do that is an unanticipated or or unplanned or undesired consequence is really irrelevant because you're going after uh, what you want for your benefit. Okay. Oh, other point I would argue with on this concept of collateral damage or of the freeloader syndrome is that I don't take a view that uh, Thomas Hobbes had, 16th century political philosopher, about the nature of human beings, especially when it comes to Missouri workers. We are not in Missouri a bunch of greedy, self centered, take what we can get without paying for it people. I represent the city of Joplin and Duquesne. I have seen firsthand that Missouri workers have a spirit, a compassion, and they do things that are right uh, in the relief of our tornado that we have down there. I think for Missouri workers, if you provide a good, beneficial service that they don't have a reason to object to, they're willing to pay for the benefit they get. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would be happy to take questions. There are questions from the committee? Representative Weber. All right, Mr. Chairman, go right here. Thanks. Gentlemen, you and I disagree on this, and it's sure. not my intention to change your mind, and I don't think it's your intention to change mine. Um, I would like to see if we can narrow down exactly where we disagree, though, and okay. figure out where the disagreement starts. Um, you, you and I disagreed last week on whether a union has to represent everybody in that bargaining union, no matter whether they're a member of that union or not. Is that accurate? Right. Okay. And just, I guess, we'll start at the very basic level. We agree this is a fact and not a value judgment. So we, sh we should be able to empirically decide whether well, one of us is right or one of us is wrong. It depends on how we, we set the parameters of the fact. Sure. Sure. What, what those include as to whether who's right, who's wrong. Right. And so I guess my, my contention, my side of the argument is that if you have a bargaining unit, and you gave the example there can be multiple unions in the same shop, and that's certainly the case because um, bargaining units can be organized um, sort of more horizontally in terms of everybody in the factory or more uh, uh, vertically in terms of job titles, you know, so people in the same shop can have different job classifications and have different unions because they're different legal bargaining units. But within that bargaining unit, when that bargaining unit is defined and it's legally defined, do you, we still disagree that a person in that bargaining unit has the legal right to be represented by that union even if whether they're a dues-paying member or not, or they're a full-fledged member of the union or not, I think so. Yes, there there's disagreements. So let me let me refer, Let me give okay. you the example and see if this. Uh, we're, we're we both work at a facility. Uh, Fifty-one percent of we have ten people. Well, okay, eleven. Uh, six people decide they want to form a union. Five of us don't. Uh, they form a union. Uh, they do their vote. Uh, there is no uh, security agreement with the corporation. I am not obligated to pay fees for what your union does. It is, in effect, an open shop. Right. So right there, you have a union. You are representing six of the workers, but I chose, and without that security agreement, I am not required, and you are not required to uh, represent me. Okay, I, I see. I disagree with that. And my understanding, and, and this should be an empirical fact that we should be able to determine, and there should, well, we should know, right, we, there, we should have a legal answer to this question. The way I understand it is if, say, there's 11 workers, six of them say, let's form a union, we now are a certified union, or a certified bargaining agent. Um, one of the five that didn't vote for the union um, didn't become an official member of the union, but does have to pay their share of the costs um, because we're, we are not a right to work state. There, there's some conflict with management. They're, they feel that, that they need to be represented in terms of um, going through the, the grievance process. Even if they didn't support voting for the union, or they haven't become a member of the union, but they're still contributing um, their share of the costs currently, they, the union still has to represent them. And so under this bill, my understanding is, if they say, okay, we no longer have to pay anything to the union, or we're still a member of that bargaining union, bargaining unit, I have a grievance, I take it through the union, the union still has to represent me. Does 
I, d I disagree with that. Okay. That may be that, that, that is my, my yeah. I would disagree with that. That okay. in in my scenario, there is no security agreement. There is no. I don't have to pay those fees. Okay. But that's a, that we, so, so so therefore you are not under an obligation to. And you know I that is the best of my research I've discovered. Yes. Okay. If, if there are multiple unit unions uh, in a in, with no, no security agreement. Uh, which union represents me then? I mean, what what if I, I I don't belong to either? I don't belong to any union. I'm just a worker, uh, not paying anybody's fees because we don't have a security agreement. Uh, do I go to Union A? Do I go to Union B? I I disagree with that contention. And as to there being an empirical right or wrong, uh, I'm an attorney. I can't remember. I don't. You're a no, wrong. not. But you know, uh, in the law, there is no there is very little uh, black and white. Right. Lots of gray and how you interpret and. What the exact facts of the exact case are, so that that is my understanding of how this works. And okay, and that would be my my. This is how it should work. If you are not, if you do not have a security agreement, and I am not forced to pay fees for something I don't want, then and I get into a bind, it, uh, my coworkers that form that union should be under no obligation to, you know. Well, it should be it shouldn't be a different question. I believe that they okay. are. Okay. I, I disagree with that, but okay. that, that would be. I'm definitely open to. Okay. Then my, more research. Fair enough. Um, we're trying to. We're, we're getting closer on what we're okay. narrowing down. My, my my last sort of line of questioning would be, um, do you do you fundamentally agree with the idea that that people get a employees get a better deal under collective bargaining than they do under individual bargaining? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You know, it, it's you know. Do, I'll extrapolate your question a little. Are, are, are unions good or bad? I think unions have a good role. Yeah, unions. I'm just talking about the concept of collective bargaining. Collective bargaining, it it it, it can work well, or it can have adverse consequences. This is not a bill that's saying that the collective bargaining is bad. But it, it essentially renders it. I mean, it, I, I disagree that it renders our uh, exam. You know, I gave numbers in one of my questions. Uh, the state of Missouri. I was wrong, by the way. I said 12. It's actually 51,000. Union jobs were lost in the state of Missouri last year. Uh, I was looking at uh, Nebraska. Oklahoma picked up 21,000 new union jobs. Uh, unions can grow in the, uh, a freedom to work state. Uh, it does, this, this does not inhibit the union's ability to, to, to go into a, a facility. To, I go back, it's kind of the free market principle. If, I, if you have a service, if a labor organization comes in and says, you know, we can represent you, this is what we, we can do for you, these are things we can fix, these are benefits we can get. If I'm a member of that and I think I'm going to get benefit for it, I'm going to join it. We, we, we agree, though, that the collective bargaining and being a union member are not necessarily synonymous terms, right? I mean, public sector employees right, public, are uh, to be union members, but they can't collectively right. bargain. Um, so I'm, I'm just talking okay. about the theory we'll collective, of... Okay, we'll pull collective bargain. Okay, I'll, but, I'll accept that distinction. Um, the example I was thinking of was with hospitals. Mm -hmm. If you have health insurance and you go to, you pay for a, for a, your, your health insurance provider is going to get a much better deal on the cost of a procedure than you will if you negotiate individually, correct? Not necessarily. Okay. Most, it seems uh, like, no, like, overwhelmingly. My wife's a surgeon. That isn't, I, might, I might argue with you seriously on that one. Okay. Well, all right, gentlemen, I, I think we're getting closer to figuring out where we disagree and we may just have to fight it out. But I, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Frank. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. So, uh, if I heard you right, you said that the motivation behind this legislation was to provide freedom to workers and to make us more competitive with surrounding states. That, that's a secondary benefit. The primary reason of the bill is freedom of association for workers. Okay. And a sec definite secondary benefit is the economic, uh, like the economic circumstance that will put us in. Why do you think that, that we're, we're this particular year, maybe the last couple of years, we, we focus so much to, uh, on the freedom of workers, not just in Missouri, but across the country. It seems to be kind of one of those issues that I'm seeing pop in more and more states that all of a sudden, some, and it's usually Republican legislators, seem to be very concerned with the freedom of workers who happen to be union members. Why do you think that is? I think they're concerned about all freedom of workers. The, the, as the breakdown goes, uh, roughly there's 7% uh, non-public sector union members in the workforce. About 4% are public sector uh, union membership. The other 89% of the workforce is not affiliated with a labor organization. Okay. Uh, that 7% deserves the same 
rights and privileges as the 89% and plus the 4% in the, the public union because they are, it is an open shop so they can choose or not choose. Or in the last couple of years, you think the Republican okay. legislators from across the state began really focusing on that 7% and decided it was time to, to well, unshackle these workers, to unchain them and provide freedom that they so desperately it, need. It wasn't 7% a few years ago. This is not the last few years. Yes. Uh, we have a former representative sitting behind me who was here in the early 2000s, I don't know exactly when he was here, uh, that, that did this, uh, oh, I think you were around, yeah. I was. So, uh, it has been brought up, it's been brought up across states, this has been an ongoing issue since, uh, you know, the, the, the concept, I think, of restricted bargaining forced unionism is, has been out there. It's been, an, you know, when you look at the history of the states, it has not it's been. out there, but I mean, it's since 1978, when, when we, we had this issue come up across the state, after 78, I didn't hear anything from from right to work for for decades. I didn't hear a peep. Well, and the last couple of years, just recently, I say the last couple of years, maybe you know three, four, five. It seems to be a, a top priority now of the Republican legislators in this state and indeed across the nation that we unshackle and provide freedom to these union, these poor union workers. And I'm just wondering why well, this is all coming to focus at this point. You know, I, I appreciate the the terms we use here. Uh, you know, unchaining the shackles is a bit uh, over the top for me. You it's, said provide freedom. I was trying to make it. Yeah, it, it is. It's it, it's ensuring a freedom of association. Okay. Uh, the people that I again, I I have, this is beginning of my second term here. Uh, my neck of the woods is Joplin Duquesne. Uh, this has been a topic. I've lived there for twenty some years. This has been a topic since I've. Been there. This is not a new topic to me. It's not a new topic to my constituents. No, but it seems to be a fairly new topic. I say fairly new, but I think the last couple of years within the legislatures. Well, I and that's what we're discussing today, and that, that's the reason I asked the question. So I'll well, move on. I'll just since I've course. been here, I had this bill the last two years. This is my third year of having. Yeah, I, mean, I consider it still be fairly recently. Um, so the other part of, of your motivation then was to make us competitive with, with the neighboring states. And I'd like to revisit a, a line of questioning that the representative from Columbia area had got into of the collective bargaining versus individual bargaining, and ask you, uh, in general, who, who actually provides, uh, uh, who generally tends to get better wages, the union workers or the non-union workers? Have an answer for that? Well, if I give you a, a, I can give you a yes or no, or like, okay, which one? Uh, can I also answer you how many jobs are available at those prices? Because union wages, if you, we have prevailing wage, which is pretty much set at union wage in most of our state, a union wage is going to be higher. Not necessarily by a lot. It may be the same. It depends on what specialty you're in and where you're located. Right. But if you're talking about this is, and you know, I am all for people getting what they, earning what they can earn. Sure. But you have my comment was you have to have the job to be able to earn it. Uh, we lost. Can you answer the question somewhere in here? Yeah. Who actually okay. tends, tends to get better wages, union members or, or? I said union. Okay, great, great. Which tells me that collective bargaining tends to be more effective than individual bargaining. No, no. it's not. If the union members tend to get higher what? wages, that, and the only difference between the union worker and the non-union worker is one engages in collective bargaining, the other engages in individual bargaining, most folks would tend to believe that, therefore, collective bargaining seems to be more effective than individual bargaining. And I, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and take a non-answer and say, what gives you or any other government agency the right to take away my most effective tool to bargain my own wages? What gives anyone one the right to take away my ability to spend my money how I wish to and associate how I wish to? That is a right uh, protected by the Missouri Constitution and the U.S. Constitution. Are you talking specifically about how, how it I'm engages? I'm talking about so my right to associate I, in, I, I, in I, my I, job. I can't answer the question if you keep talking about it. Are you talking specifically about my right to engage in collective bargaining? What gives me that right? No, I'm talking about my right Missouri to Constitution. I'm talking about my right to associate with who I wish in my workplace or which is what we're discussing here. Sure. But but you, you, you can find no constitutional authority to take away my most effective tool, which you've established now, yeah. to bargain my own wages. I don't see any constitutional authority for you to take away my right to be able to associate who I want to. Okay. That's, that's a non-answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think it was kind of a non-question. <laughs> Representative Hampton. Can I inquire? Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. I believe the latest census, the poll that we had that was conducted in 2010, showed somewhat of a decimal rate in growth in the state of Missouri. Is that accurate or inaccurate? That's correct. 
I believe the figure was around 5% in 10 years. Uh, I would have to defer to that to you. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. Well, let's just say we're in that neighborhood anyway. With that number in fact, where are these people going? And why are they leaving? Well, that, that, those were the, the, I just gave a, a general statement. What I, what I did is I looked at our border states. Uh, we have two uh, non-freedom to work states and we have six freedom to work states that we border. Some might not a very big border. Uh, I looked at those numbers, I looked at our unemployment, I looked at our job growth, uh, looked at our median income, taking into account the cost of living taxes, etc. Uh, they are going to the right to work states. So, so the, the jobs are moving over. Uh, I personally have set in at our economic conferences down in Joplin. Uh, we actually meet, it's in Kansas, it's the three state, four state, uh, kind of a combination of the chambers there and set in and very distressingly uh, in 2010 where an individual got up right before lunch and uh, talked about this brand new uh, facility he had just built on the other side of the line in Kansas with 50 some workers and their plan for a go to 120 workers and they whipped up this map and there was Kansas and a bunch of states in white, Ar uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, a couple others, and Missouri and a bunch of other states like Illinois were in gray and the guy went on with his talk, somebody raised his hand and said, why didn't, you know, we're from Joplin, Missouri, why didn't you look there? Oh, they were in a right to work state. We didn't even look, we don't we don't look in right to work states to build our factory. So we have we didn't get a chance to do any of the economic tools that we have through our economic development offices to try to say, hey, we can give you an incentive to come to our we didn't even get looked at uh, for this fair thing that it is not, in their opinion, a business friendly scenario to, to have set their factory up. So they are in Kansas and they have their fifty or hundred and twenty five jobs now uh, across the state line probably about 15 20 miles from us and that that's a that's tough to compete against when you have a town that's four or five miles away from the border thank you gentlemen thank you mr chairman representative madison uh, gentlemen just you know i, I think it's uh, it's a little difficult for me to understand uh, obviously a lot of things, but economics, I think in particular, you know, why one company moves across state line is something we're talking about a lot this year. And being in a, a district that borders Kansas City, I've seen a lot of those. Um, but I can tell you from, I mean, from my experience, and I think part of the reason we're considering a lot of different policies this year is because it's a pretty complex issue, isn't it? Oh, yeah. There... I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into it. I think one of the things we're looking at is tax policy, right? Well, you know, I, I have not, and I don't think you'd have very many people say that a freedom to work on the economic side, dropping off the association issue to begin for the time being, uh, is a panacea for all cures of all economic ills. You're, well, and it's very difficult to isolate one specific policy as the one driving force of, it, a, of an exodus of people, which is kind of what you're saying. I, I, I would say there's three main contributing, uh, the, the labor relation, uh, a freedom to work being one, taxes being two, and then government regulation being three and they're 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 all they all have to play and you know i would actually from living in kansas city i could tell you schools is a pretty important part of that calculation because actually the the school system is drastically different on, on either side um, and, and i know that just from my experience that's the reason why a lot of folks my age move across the, that state line um but the jobs aren't necessarily moving when people move i mean they may still be working in kansas city missouri and they may be working at a union job or a non-union job but um, let me ask you this, because we keep coming back to freedom of association. I do want, I don't want to take up the whole morning on this, but do you think at all about uh, the, the impact this might have on the freedom of association in a collective bargaining unit, uh, your bill? I mean, is there contention that they can still, uh, that, that would not be harmed at all in your bill? I think that if you have a, a collective bargaining unit, a union, whatever, you, however you wish to, to phrase it, you have a group of people that have created this association, I think if you provide a good product, a good service, in this case, as opposed to a product, if you represent your people well, you stand up for them, you're going to maintain your membership. A good union will have the same number of union members the day after this bill goes into effect as it did the day before it goes into effect, and two years, five years down the road, it should have the same or more if they do a good job, if they represent their people well. I don't think that we in Missouri, our workers, our people in general, are those kind of people that just take what they can get and, and are kind of smug about, ah, we can get away with this. I disagree with that. If you provide a beneficial service 
to, if in this case we're talking a, a union, if you provide a good service, you fight for your people, you get additional benefits, you get additional safety factors, uh, you provide a service, people are going to say, yes, this is in my benefit and I will support. So under your, I mean, your contention is by passing your bill, people will voluntarily pay for something I, I, that they wouldn't otherwise have to pay for. Well, they're doing it in Oklahoma. Oklahoma grew 21,000 union jobs. They don't have to join a union over there. You know, yeah, I, but are I, those, I mean, I, I would say we got 7% unionization in our state, which has gone down. It is, it is the, the trend of unions the last 25 years in Missouri is not an upward climbing thing. Right, and that's kind of so, why I think this economic thing is a big mess, because I don't think 7% of the workforce is impacting any statistic of folks moving across well, state it, line. It's 7% it's seven of its jobs we're losing. You know, but, when, when you're talking but about you said that corporations people, don't want this. So I mean, no, well, I have been told by several. I don't. They're in the room here today. That oh, corp, and I believe we heard last time. Corporations like a security agreement, so they have one person to deal with. Again, I'm not. This bill isn't interested in what corporations want. For that, I mean, we're not. I'm but not you're trying to attract corporations to Missouri with it. We're trying to attract corporations to Missouri, but the fact of them wanting to deal with union, you know, having one person to deal with is not the point of this bill. We want to attract businesses here, yeah, absolutely. I don't think that, I do not assess that, oh, okay, you can have a security agreement is going to be a big draw. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, would you like to bring your first witness, please? Good morning. My name is Greg Johns. I'm with Missourians for Right to Work. I have been with them for quite a few years, and uh, I do believe that uh, Missourians for must have the right but not be compelled to join labor unions. That's our focus. We were started in 1966 in St. Louis, Missouri, and we've been doing this for a long time before. That's basically what we believe in. Uh, last time we testified the different things, so I want to go over some of the questions that Senator Weber and some of the others had, or the representative Weber, uh, see if I can answer some of these things. Well, your time's coming. <laughs> but <clears throat> I was in, in unions for quite a few years as an organizer and a business agent and a member, and uh, never been shop steward, but that's the way it goes. But, uh, and the reason I believed in these things, getting out of the Marine Corps and got involved with uh, a company and uh, joined, it was in a union shop, joined it. it was, this was in Arizona, so I didn't have to join, but I did join. Uh, but I do believe in the concept, and I do study history, and I love it, about the founder of the American Federation of Labor, Samuel Gomper. As he started this thing in the, the terrible situations they had back in the coal mines and those situations in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And it was a, some of those things got into a bloodbath trying to organize the American Federation of Labor, if you call it history. But this is what he said about this. I want to urge devotion to the fundamentalists of human liberty, the principle of voluntarism. No lasting gain has ever come from compulsion. If we seek to force, we but tear apart that which we unite. I want to say to you men and women of the American labor movement, do not reject the cornerstone upon which this labor structure had been built, but base all your, but base your all upon voluntary principles. There may be here or there a worker for certain reasons unexplainable to us that did not join or want to join our labor union. This is, this is his right. No matter how morally wrong we may question him, it is le his legal right and no one can or dare question his exercise of that legal right. I've been in the unions for many years and uh, I've always believed in that concept of volunteerism. Even in the Department of Justice, I just, just signed posted over by your house, bill room, it says, if you have the right to work, don't let anybody take it away. Department of Justice, I just made a copy of what they post over there. I want to talk. What I want to talk about is Missouri and the situation that's going on here. Uh, the labor force in Missouri dropped by more workers in a year than in any other neighboring state. 
This is the Bureau of Labor Statistics of July 11 to July 12. Between these years, the civilian labor force across the state dropped by 41,000 jobs, according to the new data released, and that was August 15, 2012. In comparison to the eight states bordering the Show Me State, analysts of the numbers show that the labor force increased in five states and dropped in three states during that time. And this is what we're talking about, jobs. In the neighboring states, the biggest labor force drop was 19,600 in Tennessee, followed by 11,300 in Kansas, 8,800 in Illinois, and those three states equal 39,700. But our state alone lost 41,000. During the same period, five other bordering states, Oklahoma, this is the labor force, not union members, but the total labor force, climbed by 29,000, Arkansas 18,000, Nebraska 12,000, Kentucky 2,000, and Iowa 700. Now, this poll that just came out, uh, again, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics talked about the 22 states that were right to work saw an increase in the number of union membership. Right to work states had an increase of union membership from 2011 to 2012, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, by 39,000. The non right to work states, and that included also Indiana and Michigan because they weren't right to work yet, they lost union membership of three, 390,000 union members in those states. Indiana, which was included in this, they in that same period, they lost 56,000 jobs before they signed this deal. Michigan lost 42,000. Those two states alone that now are considered right-to-work states, they lost 96,000 union members in one year. So what is it saying here? We talked about this before, and you talked about the last meeting, about one of you this, that it's, if you bring right-to-work in, that this will devastate us. It's not true. Right to work states are gaining membership, union membership. I've worked in both states. I've seen them, compulsory or non compulsory states. Uh, the union membership is as good as the union members. And we, you, you can't take this point here and point there and look at this. But overall, for our state, we're losing jobs. They're going across the state, like you said, to the other side. So we need to even look at seriously what we're going to do here. Uh, we're in a kind of a whirlwind going down in the, you know, jobs, economy, our taxes coming in. The right to work states have seen an increase in membership in union membership since 2000, according to the B BLS, like I just talked about. Oklahoma, for example, passed the right to work in 2001. In 2000, they had 96,000 union members and slowly the number in Oklahoma has grown to 115,000 union members. So there is a growth there. All right, where do we sit? The highest union percentage of union members in the state of Missouri goes back to 1953. There was 35% were union members of the workforce in Missouri. All right, where are we sitting now? The last poll I got, we're, we're standing at 10.6. Overall union membership in the labor force. What is Kansas's? How many? What's the percentage of union membership in Kansas? It's 10.6 of the labor force is unionized. There were some major polls put out about union members uh, and asked the union members. And, and believe me, I've talked to enough of them through the years. And the Roper polls had it. Are you in favor of right to work or do you oppose right to work laws? The union members were the only one asked. They favored right to work by 58%. The opinion poll, and these are true polls, uh, favored right to work by 59%. A year and a half ago, Frank Lentz's poll uh, asked this question. Workers should have the right to decide whether to join a union. They should never be forced or coerced to join a labor union as a condition of employment. These were union members, 80% of them agreed that that question was correct. And we'll have all kinds of different opposition to that, but it doesn't make any difference. These polls are out, and like the lady said last, last time, how many numbers are in the polls? I don't know how many numbers. Frank Lutz is a, he's a qualified, 
He's got very good poll results. All right. Now we talked about free riders. <coughs> Labor unions claim they are forced to represent everybody in the bargaining unit if you have that negotiated in. So when you get a contract, you've got to negotiate in exclusive representation, USA, we call it USA, Union Security Agreement, you know, it's kind of patriotic, USA, and then payroll deduction. Those are three main things that like to be negotiated into a contract, if possible. And then coming back and saying, so you negotiate in exclusive representation, then you turn around and say, I can't believe we got all these free riders. Contrary to false claims that organized labor and other advocates of false unionism sometimes make, labor union officials can choose to represent only their members and allow non-members to bargain for themselves. On August 2007, a legal brief was filed with the National Labor Relations Board by 48 labor attorneys. I found the name. I just want to know because we get all these labor attorneys. And this is by the United Steelworkers of America and six other large AFL-CIO affiliates, openly acknowledged and said in this report, members only bargaining has been permissible under federal law for decades. So you can negotiate <coughs> where you don't have to bargain for non-members. Also, another in January 2008, the NLRB petition filed by other lawyers for the entire six million member changed to win Union conglomerate, which broke off from the AFL-CIO, if you remember, in 2005, six million did. They acknowledge the same thing. <clears throat> and of those seven unions that have changed to win is the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Labor International Union North America, Service Employees and International Union, United Brotherhood of Carpenters, United Farm Workers, United Food and Commercial Workers, and United Here. They, their attorneys, all agree that it is permissible under federal law that you do not have to represent non-members. So what the point is, why do you have a compulsory unionism clause? That's what this bill is talking about. Or a union security agreement. Why do you have, what, what's the purpose of it? Can a union survive without union security agreement? Will the workers join? They will join. If you do your job, allow the labor unions to make their case and allow the workers the freedom to make their choice. That's the whole point of this. Why do companies like, like right to work states? That was another question. A lot of companies have union contracts in right to work states. It works. Now, what's the, per what's the deal? Uh, maybe some of you might recognize that if uh, you're in Missouri and you have a union contract that's uh, got the union security agreement, uh, let's just use automobile parts. There's, there's a lot of them in Missouri. What do some of these companies have to do? Because of a strike threat, they have to have off-site warehouse strike protection storage. In other words, if you've got the assembly lines going at Ford and they need to have these parts to make these things, they cannot be short of this part or that part or whatever. They've got to have things. so. These companies that make these parts have to have off-site warehouse strike protection, but not all of them, but that, that's very costly. And the last thing I'm going to take questions here is, give the unions back to the union members. In the right to work state, if I and 10 others want to, don't like the way you're running the show, then we just withdraw. In Missouri, if I don't like the way the show's been running, sometimes been asked when I talk to union members, they said, if you don't like it, just quit. This bill, and you look at from 35% now down to 10.2% 2% union membership, through the years it declined, right to work states are gaining the union membership. Look at it this way. I don't want anybody to throw anything at me from behind. Maybe if you went, got rid of the union security clause, use this bill, there would be growth in union membership in Missouri. Instead of this decades after decades of decline, decline, and jobs do move out of the state because we're not right to work. 
locators we had last year came in and said that every company, that one of the first questions is right to work. So I don't know, I'm just giving you the details that I have. Any questions, it'll be like that. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to hear from Mr. Michael Lewis, please. Thank you, Representative. Members of the committee, that was a curveball, by the way. I didn't see that one coming. Um, my name is Michael Lewis. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Missouri AFL CIO. I'm here to speak in opposition to this bill. Right to work, and now I'm confused. I mean, the first witness for the, to, to testify in favor of this bill calls it right to work, not freedom of workers or whatever. It, it's just getting real confusing about what the real intent is here. Uh, are they trying to make sure workers are taken care of? Are they trying to destroy labor unions? I'm confused. The right to work proponents say that this amendment wouldn't force a union represent to represent workers who don't pay their fair share. That's incorrect, and um, I would like to yield some of my time, Mr. Chairman, to Jim Fall, who's also on that list, to clarify that with statutes. And um, I would like to say that the second time now that I've heard testimony just from the previous witness that there was a brief. Well, we all know in this room that a brief is not the decisive factor. It's the determination that's the, the, the decisive factor. And Mr. Fall will, um, will, will educate everyone here on, on those decisions. That was simply a brief, and it, it does not mean what the law is, the decision does. Um, you, a union security clause, our agreement, USA, I like that, I never heard it before, I'm, I'm gonna start using that. Thank you. Um, that uh, it's voted on, though, as part of the agreement. The entire agreement is voted on. Unions are run through a democracy system. And if 50% if plus one don't want it, you don't get it. So it's part of the agreement, it's voted on. And one thing that's never been hit on here in any either side of the chamber in these testimonies is that there's a three-year bar. Every three years, all it takes is 33% of the workers in a place to say they don't want to be union or they want to vote to make sure that the majority still wants to be union. That is a law under the National uh, Labor Relations Act. So every three years they have the opportunity to do that whether or not. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions but I would like uh, to defer my testimony to Mr. Paul. Mr. Paul, would you like to? Uh, never going to say no to Mike. <laughs> I do with my case. As said, my name is Jim Fall. Uh, I'm a labor attorney, very proud to be a union labor attorney. Um, and there is some clarification. There's been talks about briefs, and it was uh, Dick Sporting Goods case that the brief was filed in. Afterwards, a another brief by a number of unions for proposed rulemaking uh, to change the law. This all came out of a book in roughly 2002 called Let the Blue Eagle Fly. And what that book argued was that unions, the National Labor Relations Act, could be read in such a way that maybe it would allow unions to represent members only bargaining units. Uh, it was a theoretical book written by a legal scholar, an academic, um, to start thinking outside of the box to help labor law in a pro-worker, pro-union way. Uh, the Steelworkers of America, United Steelworkers uh, rather, tried to test this theory. And what they did is they got a small unit of uh, employees, members only, smaller than the entire bargaining unit, and said, we want to negotiate a contract, we are the union. The National Labor Relations Board went all the way through their uh, process by which they take the charge, review the charge, um, decide whether or not to dismiss it. They decided to dismiss it. The steel workers said, well, we understand why, because that's not what the law is. We want to try to change it. And so they asked it to go to a department called Advice. 
Advice sent back a 20-page memo saying that no, minority union bargaining, which by which I mean member-only bargaining that is smaller than a unit, is illegal under the Act. The reason that they say that is actually statutorily uh, in the National Labor Relations Act and also has, as it's been interpreted, specifically Section 9A of the Act, says that representatives designated or selected for the purpose of collective bargaining by the majority of the employees, and this is the important part, in a unit appropriate for such purposes shall be the exclusive representative of all the employees in such <coughs> unit for the purpose of collective bargaining in respects to rates of pay, wages, hours, employment, and other conditions of employment. Because of that section, the National Ra Labor Relations Board has said you have to represent everyone in the unit because that is the authority granted and that is the way that it's in. This is separate than a union security clause. This is separate than an election for um, representative, representation by a union. And this is separate again from automatic payroll deduction. If we're talking about just who is in, what is the bargaining unit when you go to an election, a union has to say, this is the bargaining unit that we are going to have an election for. They can't say that we represent these six people, if they say there's, to use the example, 11 workers, and they say we already have union cards for six of them, they could say we already have uh, union cards for 10 of them, and the company still can say, as is the right, we want to go to an election. We don't want to just recognize you. We want to force an election, um, at which case there's a big campaign, uh, a lot of uh, back and forth, um, much of which uh, the company side will admit is openly illegal, but the sanctions are nil, so they do it anyway to discourage a vote. Then there's a vote over not whether or not you want to be a union member, it's over whether or not you want to be represented by the union, have a union represent the unit. Um, after that election, say it's certified, then the union uh, goes and talks to the employees and wants you know, either to keep them as union members or encourage people to say, well, now we're the exclusive bargaining representative. We would like you to join the union as a result. All of that happened, that's the first stage. That has nothing to do with a union security agreement. That comes during a negotiation phase for a contract. The way negotiations work with the unions is that the employees and the union uh, representatives, who are by and large people that work there, I mean, this is a democratic organization, they say, these are the things that we want to look for, these are what the goals we want to achieve. And they take those uh, proposals to the bargaining table. Sometimes a union security clause is one of those proposals. Sometimes a dues deduction system from the payroll is part of those proposals. None of that has to be agreed to. It's an arm's length contractual uh, obligation, contractual negotiation rather. And it is not a mandatory thing to bargain. The employer can say, I do not want to have, I will not concede, I will not allow a, a union security clause in this agreement. And that is their right. That's not something that they have to, you know, something that they have to take to the end. Um, that's just the way it is. Uh, the, there was a brief after this Dick Sporting Goods to try to change the law through a rulemaking procedure administratively. Um, if anybody's been following the National Labor Relations Board uh, rulemaking, they've done it once in the last uh, few decades, which has been tied up in court ever since because it was something as controversial as allowing people who work in your workplace to know that the National Labor Relations Act exists and you have the right to talk to your uh, co-employees about work conditions without fear of reprisal, just like every workplace that we have as a minimum wage sign that's required. That was the extent of the rulemaking, and it's been tied up in courts for the last few years. And as of right now, the National Labor Relations Board, um, because of a decision named Noel Canning a couple of weeks ago, for all intents and purposes, doesn't exist because of uh, questions about uh, President Obama's recess appointments. So that's where we're all. That's where we're at right now, and that's the state of the law as it exists today. I just want to make one quick question. Uh, one quick point also about um, Samuel Gompers. A lot of this time we're, we're hearing shaded testimony. We're hearing part of it, and that's what we're here. We, you know, to hi highlight the best parts of our arguments, right? And, it, um, and that's where our Samuel Gompers, first of all, wasn't a coal miner. He was a cigar roller. But um, 
he talked about volunteerism because when he was organizing, closed shops were allowed. A union and its employees had the right to negotiate with an employer that the employer would only hire people who were already union members. So him saying, you have the right to voluntarily join the union or not, that's your right, we're not going to force you to do it. The reason uh, that voluntarism had more of an effect was because the contract that was negotiated with the workers said only union members will be hired. That's against the law today. That's been against the law since the 30s or 40s. And so the trade-off was that now we have allowed union security clauses, which the employees themselves say they want to bring forward and negotiate in the contract, is negotiated and is agreed to or not agreed to as part of the contract. And um, just one last point about the bar. I, don't, I believe that decertification elections can be held once every 12 months. Uh, contracts are only, can only be enforceable for three years, collective bargaining agreements. They can go for longer, but if they, somebody wants to renegotiate or decertify, they can do that. But if there's a union, if you're in between space, if you're in between the contract, there's a contract not enforced, they can decert, you know, organize your employees, your coworkers to get rid of the union then. Um, it's all about democracy, and that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to cover this in a pro-employer, uh, pro-freedom of worker, while ignoring all the employees who've sat down and said, this is what we want to protect ourselves. Or the 80-something uh, percent, of, if we're going to talk about polls, the 60, uh, over 50 percent, the 60 percent of people out there who would say, I would join a union tomorrow if I could, are being ignored. Um, there any questions? Uh, in the consideration of time, ladies and gentlemen, since we have an identical witness list for the next bill, I'm going to conclude this hearing on House Bill 95. Thank you very much for, and I think we're going to get to hear some of the same people here just in a few seconds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Representative Donna Lichtenegger from the District 146, representing all of Cape Girardeau County, except for the city of Cape Girardeau. I want to thank you for allowing me to be here today to speak on this important uh, Workers' Freedom Act of, on the ballot. There are some very, re very good reasons to consider this bill. We are looking at losing population by the year. There was a time when we had 13 congressmen in this state. As you well know, we now only have eight, and within 10 years, we will only have seven at the rate we are going. In the past 10 years, California, for instance, has lost two million residents <coughs> and jobs that went with them. 500,000 of those jobs went to Texas. Missouri has to send a message that we're not going to go that way. Osceola, Arkansas, just recently, has received a bid for a new mini steel mill. This steel mill will bring 525 jobs with an average income of $75,000 per year. They are waiting for the go from the legislature to approve a $125 million state bond issue. The governor of Arkansas has stated that if this goes through, it will be the biggest deal in Arkansas history. How many more opportunities are out there that we in the state of Missouri are losing to the other 24 states who have gone with the Workers' Freedom Act? It is important for businesses to know that they are hiring the most qualified employees they can find. 
How many of those qualified employers, are, are, I'm sorry, how many of those qualified workers are going to non-union jobs because they want the freedom to negotiate for themselves? This bill would allow union members to take back their negotiating rights. If they want to remain in a union and allow for union bosses to negotiate in his or her best interest, they can stop paying the dues. If, is that not the way that all business should be run? After all, that's the way life is run. If you would like to buy something at a grocery store, you decide how it's going to be bought. If you are dissatisfied with that, you don't buy it. So goes the Freedom Workers Act. We now have six neighboring states that all have Freedom Workers Acts. They are taking jobs the same away from Missouri daily. They also all have lower unemployment rates than we do. They all hope and they all hope to keep the same economic course that they have and that we keep the same economic course that we are on right now. Because if we stay where we are, we are going to keep losing jobs to them and they are going to take all our jobs from Missouri. In 1909, in 2009, I still haven't gotten to that 2000 year yet, we had 2.7% private sector union members. I'm simply asking you to allow those men and women to, who are union members now to have a right to vote on this. In closing, I would just like to say that 24 states can't be all wrong. Maybe it's time for the people of Missouri to have a say in the important economic issue that this is. I would take any questions from the members. Thank you. Um, you had stated, at least implied, that the motivation behind you offering this bill was to make us more competitive with some neighboring states, correct? That's right. Yeah. And how will becoming a right to work, work state do that? Well, first of all, you're not losing union jobs. That's a big misnomer. Well, I'm just asking, okay. how, does it, how does becoming a right well, to work state? Well, if you will let me make more answer better. the question, I will I'll answer it for you, sir. Um, first of all, we are not going to be losing union jobs. The, the, for instance, the steel mill that will be coming to the state of Arkansas, there is nothing in this article that says anything about the steel workers union not being there. What it does tell me is that because of the law that is in place in Arkansas, they have a right to negotiate there one way or the other. Now, if you want to know how we're losing jobs, these people didn't even come to the state of Missouri to talk to us. How many other companies are out there who have done the same thing? Perhaps you're not understanding my question. What I'm, what I'm saying is, walk me through the mechanics of how a right to work, how us becoming a right to work state will enable us to be competitive with neighboring states. Have specifically. Not, have you not, well specifically, we're not getting those companies to even come and talk to us. But how will we? How if will we, becoming a right to work Because if these people, I don't know if I'm getting through to you, sir. I, I don't if think these you are. people have a right, one way or the other, to yes. come to this state, yes. then maybe we will get those jobs. This is not the only thing we need to do in this state to change our economic outlook. There are other issues that need to be addressed. Very but good. this is the issue I have here. Okay. This is one way that we will make businesses more active in this state. Because I know people that for there, right? 20 years in St. Louis have not done a job because they do not want to haggle with the unions in, in St. Louis. Okay. So your answer then, if I can just kind of review, is that we will at least get the look-see from some of these corporations that are right now are passing us up. Do you think that's not important? No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get your, the gist of your answer. So the, your, I your, just your, said that. I just said that as we I said, will get the looks. I was going to review your answer, but basically what you're telling me is that we'll at least get the look seat, and that's how we're going to be more competitive. Correct? Yes. Thank you. So what are they looking for when they say, why are these companies desiring to win a right to work states? Say that again. Why are these companies then, therefore, desiring 
to go to right to work states. Because they feel that their negotiations are much higher than they are here. Right here, we don't have those negotiations. negotiations they are higher. very, they are very, very hard to have negotiations with people that have one stance and one stance only. And workers are losing jobs because there are no, th these companies are not coming here. Negotiations are higher, is that what you said? Harder. Harder, I'm sorry. So negotiations will be harder with a non-right to work, with the, with the workers of non-right to work states than they would be in right to work states. Say that one more time. <laughs> Very good. Sure. It's like a 2000 thing. It's, it's kind of Yeah, funny. really. So, um, <laughs> In a right-to-work state, negotiations would be easier. They would be, okay. because the union members will have more say in the way they, that they do things. The union members will have more say in the right-to-work state? Yes. I see. So, they want to go to a state where unions have more say. The workers will have more say. I'm sorry. In their unions. Gotcha. So, do you negotiate your insurance policy? No. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, as I do, uh, but you know, if I want lower rates, I talk but, to my but agent. We're not about talking it. about insurance right now, right? What's the difference? Well, I've explained to you, but if hard getting two thousand correct is tough for you, I think this may be. You no, know, that's long, not long even stretch. funny. So I'll go ahead right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, let's call our first uh, first witness for the uh, proposal. Would be Mr. Hunter. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Steve Hunter, uh, former state representative for six years, chaired chaired this committee. Uh, I think Representative Frame was on that committee the last two years. Represent one year? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's what happens when you start getting old when your memory goes too. <clears throat> and what I'd like to do is address the secondary part of this a little bit. And uh, it may kind of seem unusual. I'm going to have the Phil sponsor read a few things for me. I was uh, a, beer, a year ago in March diagnosed with macular degeneration. So things are kind of fuzzy on me. <clears throat> so um, I think it would probably be better for her to do this and then we can uh, talk about it. What I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit about uh, two states uh, that passed freedom to work type bills, Oklahoma through, um, through the ballot process, which I think one thing I want to do add is that I uh, am testifying for this bill, but I am not for putting any of this on the ballot. Um, and also talk a little bit about Indiana and their growth, and I think they've had this type of bill about one year somewhere through there. Um, this information comes from the governor and part of her state of the state address. If you could read the darkened part back there, and then I'll share sure. since, since January of 2011, we've created over 62,400 new net jobs, giving us the fourth highest growth rate in the United States. Unemployment in Oklahoma has been reduced from 7% in 2010 to an enviable 5.1% today, one of the lowest rates in the nation. Our medium household income rose in, 2000, in 2011 from 4,000, placing Oklahoma at number one in the country. Oklahoma has enjoyed the growth far faster than the national average. For example, according to Oklahoma in 2003 and 2011, Oklahoma's job gain has been more than two and a half times the average of forced unionism rates, then 28 in number, and nearly 80% greater than the average for these for its three non for its three non-right-to-work neighbors, Missouri, Colorado, and New Mexico. Over the same period, inflation-adjusted BEA data shows private sector employers' layouts for employee compensation grew by 17.9% in Oklahoma. 
real private sector compensation expanded at the rate seven times the non-right-to-work states, average of 2.5% and quadruple the 4.1% aggregated gain for Oklahoma's non-right-to-work neighbors. Moreover, the direct impact of Oklahoma's signature oil and gas extractions industry actually accounted for less than 16% of its overall real gain in compensation. This next is, uh, <clears throat> is from Indiana on site selection. They recently, I think within a year, 16, 14 to 16 months, I can't remember exactly when, they passed it. This is from site selection. This is an interview with uh, David Hasler, who is Secretary of Commerce and CEO of Indiana Economic Development. Uh, there's a briefly, if you'll read your bite. I think that right, that paragraph is that far. That more handsome. We are up to 175 deals so far this year. Networks is a company out of California that has recently purchased a huge pharmaceutical facility in Terre Haute and is in the process of investing upwards of $90 million into its refurbishment and enhancement. Toyota announced a $130 million expansion in Princeton for manufacturing. Amazon in Jeffersonville in southern Indiana announced an $80 million warehousing facility. Cummins, con Cummins continues expansion with, a with 220 million projects in Seymour for its high horsepower division. Steel Dynamics announced Right to Work was one of the key reasons that they came to Pittsburgh with 75 million faculty. Now, facility project, with its $70 million facility project. Rochester Diagnostics announced $300 million expansion in Indianapolis, and Greenville Technologies of Japan does industry mold work as a big supplier of, of Honda, and they are doing $22 million expansion here. Their first time in, sorry, part of this is cut off. <laughs> is that good? Okay. I guess my point is, Mr. Chairman, that, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I introduced, this, introduced this bill probably in 06 for four years, something like that. And uh, I watched this escalate about about jobs moving in and out. And I sit and look at Missouri, we're sitting, and I always felt this, that as chairman of this committee, we sit in, right in the middle of the United States. And if you break down this state and the impact if we pass this bill tomorrow, um, how it would immediately help us? I had an interesting conversation with the Secretary, or the Secretary of State about a month ago from Kansas. I'd heard him speak, and I wanted to introduce myself. And we were talking about uh, some, some of the things that, that they're doing over in their state with tax issues and things like that. And he said, you know, if we could, if we can, and we will, get our cigarette taxes and our gas taxes down to Missouri, I'll have no need to come over to this state to buy my gas or any cigarettes or anything else. He said, that's one goal. And he looked at me and he said, and I'll tell you what, we hope and pray every day that you don't pass right to work in your state. So, I, I, I mean, I didn't flabbergast me, but I mean, he was pretty bold about saying it. So I still looked at it, and I look at this state, and I see uh, Kansas City. I'm in the western part of the state. We've got a ranch up in northern Missouri, and I go up there. I'm kind of a western side of the state guy. And I remember when Kansas City was alive and vibrant you know, 30 years ago when I was out young and running. And to look at it now and to see what's happening over there, and I think probably if we passed a bill tomorrow, it would give us an economic, it would give us the advantage of stopping the blood flow go over into Kansas for what they're doing. It's like Quantrell's Raiders in the Civil War coming over there, only coming in three-piece suits and taking business away. If you look at it at St. Louis, they're sitting right next to Illinois. Well, Indiana's cleaning them out on parts of it. We could start pulling businesses away. It's a competitive situation. 
down our way in Joplin, we're probably as close to right to work or freedom to work as, as you can get, but we're losing jobs. If you go down and you, you drive from, from, from Missouri and drive over into northwest Arkansas and look at the development down there they've got, if you drive on into Tulsa and Oklahoma, you see it. But I think one of the biggest things we've got that would benefit is in, in Cape or all these rural counties that have no advantages to all, and I call them black counties because they're, I mean, everybody's dying off. There's not enough people to replace them, and there's no reason to come there. You can't get businesses to come in there, any kind of manufacturing, anything like that. I think that gives us great advantage to be able to do that. And my fear is that we're falling faster, farther and farther behind, faster and faster. So uh, I guess with 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 that testimony, I'll just entertain any questions. Representative McManus. Okay. And this could be a question, I guess, for both of you, because I think it kind of hits on something that we've heard. You know, I, I keep hearing that we have this mass exodus of people out of our state. I mean, is that something you do? You have any data to back that up? Is there you know, you're kind of young. I am. I like you. <laughs> you know, does the fact that we used to have 13 congressional seats and we're well, down to eight now yeah, and not show you that we are losing? Well, yeah, but it shows me that, I mean, actually, I looked it up. In the census, actually, we grew in the last decade by 7%. And we not actually, by most other states, though. That's why we lost a congressional district. I, and I'm glad you're concerned about Russ Carnahan's district because that, for me, you know, as another Democrat, we lost. But, but I think... <laughs> We outpaced not only every Midwest state. The, we grew by 7%. The Midwest grew by 3.4, so we doubled it. But we outpaced every right to work state around us in population growth, too. The only state that outpaced us is Illinois. Well, guess what? All those right to work states that, that you say that we outgrew, yeah. their economy is much better than ours is. And, and so. Well, I guess, and I'm not making a, you know, I'm not making a, statistical argument here because I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm not really sure we have any data that really Well, I will tell you, for instance, I have two companies, one in Oklahoma and one in Texas. The one in Texas, I, we would sincerely think about bringing it here. There was no doubt that we would bring it here if we were a right-to-work state or a workers' freedom state, okay? So that's we are point. not going to do that as long as it is. Right. I love this state. My family is here. I do not want to leave this state. And I share that feeling. Like, okay? I, yeah. But there's a possibility that we will move to Texas because we're going to do a lot better down there than we are here. I just wonder, I guess, if the fears of our death are greatly exaggerated. You know, I, I mean, I, I get this feeling that there's just so much negativity. I'm, I'm optimistic like you. I mean, I think... Our state's a great place to, to live and grow business, and I hope, you know, I, I think, kind of as I was saying earlier, I think this is a complicated issue why certain businesses locate in one state versus another, and I, I understand this is part of your exploration of that issue, but thank you for the inquiry. You're welcome. Representative Frank, you're fine. Go ahead. Thank you. Ms. Saunders, good to see you again, sir. Good to see you. So I, I, I want to go ahead and visit this, the same question I was asking the, the, the good lady from Cape area so the why folks would um, consider moving their factory to a right to work state over the non right to work state and I'm, I'm trying to get down as to what actually are the mechanics of it I, I got from her at least they'll, they'll at least give us a look see that they're not giving us right now which I don't know if I can really go along with because you look at express scripts they could have gone anywhere at all in, in the world but but they chose to go right here to St. Louis, a, a very union town. So uh, what, what it is actually, once they do give us the look-see, well, or, or even, maybe that's not your answer, what, what will we do to become more competitive if we join the right to work state? What happens? Well, I, I think, um, and I, I actually tried to bring in a site locator and they wanted to charge us $8,000 and I didn't have that. <laughs> But I think, look in your other pocket. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you, you'll find when you retire from here, Reverend friend, that that uh, retirement doesn't go all that far. Yes, sir. It, it probably doesn't even pay for your insurance if you keep it. Yes, sir. Um, but I do have, uh, I had one come in two years ago in the Senate. I've talked to site locators. Actually, my cousin is, is, uh, works with a big uh, commercial real estate developer and they also like to do site locations and when and it's especially in manufacturing if they look at manufacturing 
they don't even give you a second look. If you're not a freedom to work or right to work state, you're out. So we don't get an opportunity to even interview those people. And so, um, and, and, and honestly, uh, this is one step, as she said. I mean, this is part of a whole total package. But I just feel like that, that if we, because of where we sit, we sit right in the middle, the pathway right in the middle of the United States with roads going through here. And if you know, we've got a beautiful state and all that, it gives us a competitive advantage. Now, the, the, the geography does. Well, a freedom to work or right, geography is one thing, yeah. Because I think if, if you start making things in this state again, it's easy, it's cheaper to ship them north, south, east, or west. Yeah. In fact, I could go on for an hour and a half about this thing over in Kansas City, okay. But, but I think that now, once, if this passed tomorrow, that doesn't mean we're going to get these because there's other competitive things going on. I mean, you know, but it gives us an, a, at least equal footing to be competitive. And I look at it and to be competitive now. To be competitive with other states trying to recruit these businesses. Get that look see. Right. Okay. And you mentioned an express drift, and I'm more than happy to see them here, but they don't make anything. You know, I was thinking about that comment the other day, and I thought that's great, but basically you have to have money, you have to make things to buy things. And you're buying prescriptions, basically what they do is they you know, it has to do with prescriptions and all that. But yeah. so, so is it, are, are you saying then just if I can are you saying then that it's, it really is manufacturing that we're talking about here? That I manufacturing think is the, the companies we're trying to recruit that we can't right now because we're a non right to work I think it's probably, I'd say manufacturing is the number one, although I, I, I had an interesting, and I don't want to take too long on this thing, but I, and, and technology, yeah, because I tell you, um, Senator Mayer is a good friend of one of my best friends, and we talk, now he's now judging us all kinds of times, so we, and he, and he, yeah. So anyhow, he uh, called, we were just talking, he said, hey, Hunter, he said, uh, had some lady call and send an email from California, and she's, she's talking about moving businesses to Missouri. And I said, well, you kind of, you care if I call her, and I'm kind of a bold guy, and I said, he said, yeah, I don't care, I'm not, I'm not the president of the Senate anymore, I don't care. So I've talked to her three times, and I said, tell me what you do and why you're looking at Missouri. And she said, well, we move human capital. I said, what's human capital? She says, well, there's highly educated people out of Silicon Valley, and we, we're looking to move companies because we're tired of California, it's falling apart, and we want to move to good areas where we can raise our families. So I said, why would you pick, where are you looking at Missouri, and why would you pick them? And she said, well, I'm looking at Southwest and Northwest. Well, I live in Joplin, you know where that's at. So I said, well, I live in Joplin, but we got a ranch up in northern Missouri. Why, why are you, she says, well, we like the small community. I said, why would you look at northwest Missouri? And she said, we want to get up there. We want small schools. We want to get up, we can set up a business of 50 people. We don't want to have the hassle of unionization. If we want to unionize, fine, not fine. But it's a, it's a nightmare here, and that's the deal breaker. And I said, well, how many people are you looking? She said, I'll bet you 25 to 30 percent of the people that are friends of ours want to get out and come back to the Midwest. It's almost like the reverse rat, grapes of wrath. You know, you heard where they were going, now they're coming this way. Did, did you inquire at all as, as to what the hassle of unionization was? No, I didn't. That's just a statement okay. she made. Understood. Okay. Okay. So, so um, but I mean, you know, I think about it, and I, and I jokingly have said that if if you think in my little town where, I, where I'd really love to go back and, and, and live, it's about 1,800 people. They've got a nice little airport. They've got a little economic development area. They can't get anything going there. They almost lost a factory that makes great big, huge air conditioners going to Mexico. Their quality of work was good. They saved it, thank God. It's about 200 jobs. Union jobs, as a matter of fact, paying 16, 17, 18 dollars an hour and, and, and do good, great work. Well, you know, if you think about it, if there's like Say like 10 or 12 families come in. First of all, these people have money. They're going to build a new house. They're going to buy property. And they're highly intelligent. They'll probably double the IQ of the town just walking through the end, you know, end of the town. I, I just said jokingly. But, uh, but I mean, I think that's the kind of things we're missing. And I was sitting watching one of the business shows, and I see these, and, and, and this, these people that we're talking about are moving into Texas, doing the same thing. And I'm, I, I sit there looking at things. Those opportunities we're missing. And these are these are people in their twenties to forties that are productive. They're not old dudes like me going blind, you know. Uh, 
Well, Steve, Steve can, I, can I show you where I'm kind of going with this? Absolutely. It is, what I'm wondering is, I'm hearing two answers. One, so we get that look-see from, from the site selection committees. And the other one, so we don't have the hassle of unionization. And I'm wondering what the look-see is all about as to why they're looking at right-to-work states. And my guess is, and no one's saying it here, no one's giving that kind of answer, and, and probably for good reason. I think, I don't know if you guys attended that, that training they had for how to answer right-to-work questions, but it, it would go against that training completely if you did so, is that I think that the folks like me are thinking that if the way that you guys see us becoming more competitive and competing against neighboring states is by lowering our wages. I don't think so. But, 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 but hold on, hold on. So I, I, what I'm saying is I know that union workers tend to make more than non-union workers. I know that right-to-work states tend to have weaker unions than, right, than, than union states. I know with weaker unions, you actually get less in wage increases. So everything that I'm hearing from all these witnesses comes out to that there is a design here that what we want to do and how we're going to compete is the lower wages and it's a race to the bottom for workers' wages, and that's not the type of state that I want to live in. That's not the type of government I want promoting this, and that's my fear on right-to-work legislation. And I, and, I, and I can understand that, but I think I can get some probably some national figures that show that uh, in some cases that the wage may go down, but it's the most important part of it is, is how much money you put in your pocket. So if you go into the right to work or freedom to work states, they generally have lower costs of living, which you put more money in your pocket. And I think the average is around $4,200 per family. Are, are, you just, are you saying then that Representative Frame don't worry about making less wages because then the standard of living will go down, therefore the cost of no, living? No, sir, I didn't say standard of living. I said- I'm sorry, co cost of living, I'm sorry. I said, I, it, whether you, if you make, a hundred thousand dollars and you put five thousand you save five thousand if you're making fifty and you put ten thousand in the bank i would rather go to where i can put more money in my pocket in the bank right and that's that's and and, and the figure the facts and figures are there now now there's one thing that i that i make sure that i'm there with steve so are, is that is that the testimony then that don't worry about making less in wages because the cost of living will go down what i said was in some cases I said, in some cases, let me let me give you an, an example of something oh, that I've Missouri. Pardon me. The case of Missouri, because that's what we're, what we're talking about here. So the cost of living will therefore go down. Don't worry about the less wages. I I point. said in, I said in right to work states. Yes, sir. Generally, right. The average is about forty two hundred forty two to forty four hundred dollars you put in your pocket because the cost of living is much lower. That wage is all. That the wage is not necessarily based. It's based on competition. Sure, sure, sure. So you know, I can't tell you. Now, I tell you something. That I did discover when I was putting this bill together. I thought, and I think Mark Mix addressed this. Um, when I started working on this eight or ten years ago, and I thought every business would be all over this. Well, I never could get a commitment, and I'm not going to name names from where I came from. Okay, sure. and and frankly, they're a manufacturer, and they pay probably back then probably eleven, twelve bucks an hour. And I thought, well, you know, they'd be all over this thing. Well, I, they weren't. And then I, as I, you know, because I addressed lots of other issues in that committee, and I'd bring it up, and some of these bigger corporations never got on board. So I was visiting with a, another gentleman that has a big corporation. Uh, the, the biggest of what they do in the, in the United States, actually, and, and we were talking about freedom to work and right to work and all that, and he said, you know, is there a difference? Because I'm hearing both terms. Is there a difference? Well, that's a the one freedom to work and right to work the same bill. The one political you know, better, right, right. Okay. Well, I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm, I'm, look, representing frame, I'm not a guy. I tell you what, it, it goes. I don't mess around. Fair enough. So, um, he, he made the statement, he said, I, it would probably hurt me. And I, I said, why? Because I couldn't figure out what he meant. And he said, well, I probably, I said, he said, I may have to pay a higher wage. I said, why would you have to pay a higher wage if we became freedom to work? And he said, because it gets more competitive. If someone comes into where I'm at, and they put a, a, some kind of factory in here, right. and he said, I pay pretty close to union wages. He said, I found it works the best. He said, I can make moves. He, he said, I can make business moves. He said everything works fine, but he said if someone comes in and they pay a slightly higher wage to hire my best people away, I've got to bring that wage in. Well, then it hit me because they were paying eleven dollars an hour down our way, and if 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 someone comes in, we missed out on the Mitsubishi plant probably twenty years ago. 
I know exactly where it's going to go. They said they would not come in if you weren't right to work. We missed out on that plan. So I got to thinking about that. Well, that's probably true because they wage around there's also like 11 to $16 an hour, okay, for, for, for pretty good, you know, pretty good wages, factory wages, whatever. Well, if, say, Mitsubishi or Toyota comes in and they pay, they're going to pay pretty close to union wage. They're going to hire the best workers away. It's a rising tide. Everybody else in our area is going to have to pay a higher wage. And that was kind of an economic shock to me. So um, I think there's a lot of factors. I think everybody thinks that all businesses are for this. The element of greed is in there a lot. I want to try to microwave the answer here because I know the community has okay. other questions. So, uh, again, what, what I'm hearing from, from uh, people uh, sponsoring this bill, what I'm hearing from people supporting this bill, is that the right to work. Uh, it, 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 we won't be look see because we're not right to work state. I'm, I'm thinking that many of these companies are thinking if you were right to work state, then we could have lower wages. If we have lower wages, we're going, oh, 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 oh. if we have lower wages, I'm hearing from, from people like you saying, don't so worry about so much about lower wages because lower wages live, lead to a lower cost of living. And what I'm saying is it also will lead to a lower standard of living, sir, because. I think there was some some argument last year or so of who creates jobs in in this nation. Is it is a small business or is I'm sorry, it, uh, Republicans were charged with Democrats. Then we're saying government doesn't create jobs, and, and and it's business who creates jobs. And I'm telling you right now, what I believe is customers create jobs, and we are beginning to decimate our middle class. This does nothing whatsoever to strengthen our middle class. This will actually lead to a lower cost of living, and finally, though, a standard of living. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would like to address that, um, if I could, for two seconds. Make it, uh, make it really quick. We've got a lot of witnesses that won't have a chance to testify. Okay. In Bullinger County, which was, and I've worked in Bullinger County for almost 20 years as a dental hygienist. I did a lot of Medicaid in that, in that as a dental hygienist. As I saw the hat factory and the shoe factory leave, that's when, when things went down. Then we had a company called Rubbermaid come to Jackson. And a lot of people, not just in Cape Girardeau, but also in Bullinger County, came to work at this factory. It was not a right to work factory. They came there because of our schools and they came in Jackson. Okay? These companies do business in different ways in different counties. P and G came to Jackson because our Cape Girardeau County, it's in the county came there, non-union shop, because of our schools and the way our workers work. They, both of these people pay union wages. That there's no difference, okay? They upped the economic power of both of those counties. And we have, an, we have a couple of other companies who have done the same thing. They come because of our school districts and they come because of our workforce. Um, I think that we could get even more if we if people knew that we were going to stay that way for sure. Thank you. I have a request from uh, Missouri Department of Labor Director Lawrence Redman. Testify, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Larry Redman, Director of the Missouri Department of Labor and Industrial Relations. I'm going to be brief. Um, the administration is opposed to this legislation. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> That's brief. Mr. Jeff Abusi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not going to be redundant to talk about some of the things that we mentioned last week in this committee regarding the statistics and the hundreds of millions of dollars that we put into health care and pension and our investment training. But I would like to maybe comment. Am I on this? Sure. Thank you. Um, I would like to comment as we talk about some of the things that attract businesses to Missouri. And I think that we have to be, we have really have to search our souls as, as legislators to talk about maybe tax policy as a representative to my left that talks about her business in Texas. I think the fact that we're seeing a migration of companies leaving California and maybe moving to the Austin, Texas area and to that state 
has something to do with the tax policy. I believe that Texas does not have state income tax. I think we've seen some of that in, in Tennessee, which is also a right to work state. But and we've also heard some testimony today from people that made mention of site locators and what it takes to get interested in moving businesses globally and also around this country. And I too uh, have spent some time with the RCGA since I'm on their board to participate with 12 site locators that came to St. Louis last year to talk about you know, what interests Missouri to them. And it was really funny because they never mentioned right to work. And this thing that they talked about that appealed mostly to their clients was logistics, weather, and so if we see this trend to the south, and we talk about the migration of companies in states like Texas, weather played a big, climate was a big factor. But one thing that they recognized with us was a highly skilled workforce and how it became highly skilled. And as it talked about building and construction, since I represent the building and construction trades in St. Louis, they want to know about our workforce. They want to know the availability to build factories and facilities for their potential customers and whether we had enough people, the capacity to build these things on time, under budget, and ahead of schedule so that their clients could mobilize into a location in a very timely manner. So in talking to all these 12 site locators with the RCGA, none of them had any fear or said that right to work was top on their priority. He said, now we do get asked, but most importantly, we want to know about the skilled workforce and what do you, how, how trained are they? You know, are they community colleges, are the universities putting out people that are retaining and staying in that area? So I really kind of take a front to the fact that, that that's such a big, big issue because I can almost tell you that the sponsor of legislation, if we could find out how much percentage of union density exists in their counties, how many of those factories that exist there are unionized shops? And how many of those people are leaving and going to Oklahoma and Texas because they were threatened by unionizing manufacturing? I mean, we, we have a, a bill that's before this legislation, uh, this legislature about uh, with Ameren, Missouri, and SMRs, and new technology. And I'm proud to say that we'll be a part of that if that happens, because of our highly skilled and well-trained workforce that we pay for, and that we don't ask you all to appropriate money to train our people. But just two years ago, we courted a company that was from London, Emerald Automotive. They have a site in St. Louis that they're trying to develop. They came here because they knew that there were highly skilled assembly workers from the closing of our automotive plants that they could hire, and they wanted to have a union shop. So I, the myth that people leave and that there's this phobia because the unions are going to organize their shop, I can tell you that they're probably not in Joplin on organizing campaigns today, and they're probably not in Cape Girardeau on organizing campaigns. If they're union down there, it's because those employers want to be as much as the employees are. And with that, thank you for your time. If I could leave some testimony from people that weren't afforded the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much. Mr. Bruce Hillis. Chairman. <coughs> Uh, members of the committee, my name is Bruce Hillis. I'm a citizen advocate. I live in Mexico, Missouri. I'm not uh, supported by a PAC or corporation or a union. Uh, matter of fact, the only PAC I have, I jokingly say, is spelled with a K and drooped over my shoulder. It doesn't really support me. It drags me down most of the time. My calling card has one simple phrase on it besides my name and address. Advance justice, not advantage. And that's what I encourage you to do in supporting this bill. Is this bill complete justice? No. It's partial justice. 
It's only a partial remedy. Federal labor law violates the rights of almost everybody. It violates the rights of the workers who choose not to, don't want to belong to a union. It violates the uh, unions and forces them to uh, negotiate or uh, on behalf of non-union members. It violates the rights of employers. For once the, a, a bargaining unit is established, it makes him bargain in good faith. It doesn't allow him to bargain with whom he may choose. And that's a violation of his rights. But more importantly, it violates the rights of this state to regulate an area of labor law. The federal government has usurped that power that right from the state. It's taken on powers in labor law way beyond its authority. So this, this bill is only a partial remedy. I encourage you to do more, to advocate to the federal government to either repeal all federal labor law, allowing the natural right of contract between unions and employees, between employees and employers, or the state nullify all federal labor law. Once you do that, I'd even encourage you to put in this bill that it's sunset when you nullify all federal labor law because right to work won't be necessary. That concludes my remarks. I'd be glad to answer any of your questions. Representative Weber. Um, so two questions. One, uh, you do agree that federal law requires Unions to represent everybody in the bargaining unit. Federal, the law, the law as well as the courts, very muddled on the issue. I think there's room for people on both sides of the argument to be, to argue on the point. I happen to believe that it is an intervention in the in the rights of unions, and I believe that it makes them want to negotiate for all their members. Okay, and say non-members. And second, you said that you believe the the, the obligation to bargain in good faith is a violation of rights to form a contract? Uh, absolutely. You are consistent. We disagree, but you are incredibly consistent. I, try to I, will, I will give you that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We now hear from Mr. Scott Ramshaw. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, committee members, uh, just want to touch on a couple of things too. Uh, seems like economic development did get uh, did get brought into the conversation this morning. Um, the representative was talking about a project down in Cape with P&G, and they're getting ready to expand with a huge expansion down there. Um, you got to watch what we say because of confidentiality agreements, but they are reaching out to contractors in Missouri to, to do their project, just like they did when they uh, built the existing plant. So um, with that, we're looking forward to uh, the work down there to, to help get their facility up and running. Um, there's a couple of things on a project that you look at. Um, this gentleman said he was from Mexico, Missouri. One of our contractors has a fabrication shop in Mexico, in uh, Macon, Missouri. And what they do is they fabricate modular systems, mechanical systems, that can go into facilities to expedite the timetable that a project is built so they can speed the construction time up and save money. And a lot of that work can be done inside. The modules could be anywhere from 14 to 16 foot wide. Same on height, 60 foot long, and they're shipped into these facilities and they're bolted up and welded together. And it helps uh, it's the end users, P&G, all the other ones, that's what they want because, like I said, that global economy they're competing against, they can't be down for long or they lose those uh, contracts that they're competing against. A couple, a representative, former Representative Hunter was talking about different projects as far as economic development. Think back about when we were talking about the airplane company that wanted to come to Missouri a couple years ago. Think, think about the $8 billion facility that Amer wanted to build in Callaway. Um, you know, those jobs, they're, they're gone. And, you know, one of the things about any legislator or any party, uh, Duke McVeigh used to say from the Missouri FLCIO, you gotta, you gotta 
if you want to be in charge, you got to realize the state of Missouri doesn't have the money to compete against other states on economic development, and that's where we're at right now. So we just hate to see the workers get beaten down on, I guess, a short-term, long-term plan. So with that, we're in opposition, and um, with the plumbers and pipe fitters out of St. Louis. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Craighead, would you like to testify? <coughs> Morning, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee. We all, I'm here uh, testifying for the United Steel Workers District 11, uh, also going on record as being opposed to this bill. Our facilities and plants that we represent here in Missouri do not want this law because it splits the workforce, puts too many other variables inside, and we're inside the facility. We'll be squabbling and fighting and organizing and not organizing. And it just causes way too much trouble, and in that regard, they're not for this. That's the only thing I'm going to add to that. Any question? Thank you very much, sir. Ms. Denise Hasty. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Denise Hasty. I'm Vice President of Governmental Affairs for Associated General Contractors, the AGC of St. Louis. And uh, we are opposed to this bill as we were opposed to uh, the bill from last week. And I don't want to bore you with the same uh, details, but I will leave my written testimony and I will also um, leave our, our um, position paper. And I would ask that you please look at that position paper because the construction industry would be part hit particularly hard uh, in a right to work situation because of the Federal Employee Retirement Income Security Act, the ERISA Act, and it, it puts a significant burden of a financial burden that could uh, close the doors of many long standing large contracting firms in our uh, state, which would impact a lot of employment. And I just urge you to oppose this bill. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Berry. Good morning, Chairman and Representatives. I am opposed to this bill also. I am a member of the UFCW Local 655, and we represent about 10,000 members, and 52% of those members are women. Union membership narrows the gap between men and women from 17.8% nationwide to 10.5% nationwide. Women in right-to-work states earn $5,434 less per year than women in states without these laws. Women workers in unions earn $226 more each week than non-union members. I believe the freedom for workers to join and bargain collectively for better wages, benefits, and a voice in the working workplace has been the bedrock of America law for nearly 80 years. Women in Missouri already struggle hard enough each day in the workplace. This so-called right to work bill law hurts all workers, especially women and minorities. As a proud union member and a woman of USCW Local 655, I ask you to stop the attack on unions and their members and work on legislation that benefits working people in Missouri. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Brown. Good morning, Chairman, honorable uh, members of the committee. For the record, Clark Brown, uh, Missouri uh, State Council of SEIU Service Employees Union. Um, I, I think I would like to just uh, review and just a, kind of a layman's message about a couple of things here. I think that we <coughs> have gotten re really clouded about the issue of economics and the jobs and, and Really, to go back, I think, and look at the intent or the fundamental pieces of the, the right to work legislation that we've been talking about, I think we're getting into the question of individual choice in, in 
union membership. And I, I'd like to say there's, there's obstacles to look at this for unions and their responsibilities to, to represent workers. Um, we take uh, sincerity in looking at, we have to collectively represent workers. And if, if we become the certified representative, as I think legal counsel did well in trying to <clears throat> describe for you, I want to make sure you know that we have a duty to represent those workers once that happens. And I think with that responsibility for us, the fundamental task about representing workers, it comes with doing that with collective bargaining. And to look at the individual abilities here goes against the fundamental uh, responsibility for us. And so we want to be on the record as opposed to this. Uh, I also have, uh, and I'll submit uh, testimony, written testimony from Missouri Home Care Workers Union. I think there were some prior discussions on the prior legislation that we reviewed in this committee that I'll also leave here too. Thank you very much. As our time has expired, this is going to conclude our hearing. I uh, appreciate everyone coming. If you have any written testimony or witness forms, please leave them.